Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. You may not know Tom Fletcher as a household name, but you have seen his work. In single-handedly transforming the way we watch sports, he is the man behind the unique camera angles you see in every sports broadcast because of his genius at using robotic cameras. <clears throat> Here are a few. Above the rim and behind the backboard in basketball. Behind the net and inside the net in hockey. Center ice speed shot for hockey. Center scoreboard camera in hockey and basketball. Dugout and low home cameras in Major League Baseball the NFL goalpost camera, the NASCAR speed shot. Given how much we take these innovative camera shots for granted, it's no surprise that Tom Fletcher has been named to the Sports Broadcasting Hall of Fame in 2023. He also has five national Emmys for the application of robotic cameras in sports broadcasting. Fletcher is the president and founder of Memento, a company that provides game attendees camera captures of themselves as a game day keepsake. He's been the director of marketing optical division, op, optical devices division at Fujifilm since 2016. Please welcome Tom Fletcher. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Excited to be here. What are some of the other jobs you've had before you actually got into sports broadcasting? Well, my father and I started the business together in 1987 to service the electronic news gathering, uh, one-man bands for news crews around the country. And we really took advantage of the transition from a two-man crew to a single-man crew, and they needed new equipment to be able to operate with beta cams, a single camera recorder, and we rode the, the technology of seeing that change. And I think that really instilled in, into me to look out for the changing technologies. And I would say if, if I have one good skill, it's really recognizing trends that are happening in the industry and adapting to them. So we dealt a lot with news crews. Then we also started into the motion picture division. Fletcher Chicago was the name of our company. Some people would call it Fletcher Camera from the motion picture side, where we serviced motion pictures. The biggest motion picture that we did was Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, which is a big feature that we serviced out of our New Orleans office, as well as uh, in Canada and in San Francisco. So TV shows like Chicago Fire and Empire that were shot here in Chicago. So we did a lot of, of major high-end motion picture work, uh, renting motion picture film cameras. And then we had our sports division. So everybody in the sports side knows us as Fletcher Sports. A lot of these people don't know that we've got these other these other avenues. They're like, you know, when, when it was announced that I got this award, a lot of my friends in the American Society of Cinematographers are like, I didn't even know you guys did anything with sports. <laughs> and then my sports people have no idea that I'm a member of the ASC, associate member of the ASC, and deal with high-end cinematographers and from my days as a rental company, and then my days with Fujinon making lenses and designing lenses for them. How do you see the camera as the integral part, as an integral part of telling stories? Well, in the, in the sports world, uh, I always look for that new camera position. Uh, I would say to my wife, when I'm watching sports at home, which is pretty frequent, that this is work. And to a portion that was true because I'm just watching, I'm watching the broadcast and seeing how, how the director is using and any new camera angles that they're using. When I'm on site, I would always look for places for us to put our robotic cameras. Initially, the, the hothead, which was the first robotic camera that we had, 
that was designed for the motion picture business. We rented it to Backdraft, the movie shot here in Chicago, because they wanted to stick it into fires and not have people you know, get hurt. What I saw was is there was more application of putting it in the bottom of the scoreboard to shoot hockey and basketball shooting straight down. It was the 1991 NBA Finals that we did here in Chicago. Thank you to Michael Jordan for his historic run and the Bulls that NBC said, sure, we'll try this camera. And Mike Fratello was the, the color analyst along with Marv Albert. And um, he just loved being able to telestrate the Bulls offense. And that shot became something that everybody had to have. And then the Andy Rosenberg, who was the director, he's like, Tom, you know, I need something new next year. Because Rudy <laughs> Martsky wrote about it the first year in USA Today. And Andy needed uh, to be, you know, coming up with something new. And, you know, a couple of years later, we put a camera behind the backboard as cameras got smaller and smaller. And we had the success of giving that slam cam, remote control slam cam, not just a fixed angle. You know, it's one thing to have a camera here. It's just always here. But if it can literally pan with the, with the player as he's coming in for a slam dunk, that was quite uh, amazing. We did that at the... Uh, NBA All-Star Game in Minnesota. The broadcasters control uh, and the league controls the events for an All-Star Game, whereas a regular season game, you got to deal with a lot of other people, but the league and the, and the rights holder, NBC in this case, has complete freedom to do a lot of things. We had to get permission from David Stern to put cameras there and get sign-off from the coaches same within hockey, when we put cameras behind the net on top of the score judge box, we had to get permission from the league, but we also had to get the individual sign off from the teams. And Gary Bettman was phenomenal in, in greasing and making sure that that the teams, you know, were behind it. At the time, the, the, the hothead was, I'd say, the size of two bread boxes, and it was literally put on top of the, of the goal judge box, and it probably block some fans views mm -hmm. and but it literally was a phenomenal shot that's used you know to this day on pretty much every power play and Gary and his whole broadcasting department team really pushed to get it in and we ultimately got it down to about half of the size of a bread box I remember when that camera went in the back of the net I thought that was wow that was I always wondered how it didn't get broken <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had it break. I remember being down in Carolina and there was a stoppage in play and the commentators were like, it looks like the referees in the glass, it looks like he's picking up glass. <laughs> and um, Carolina's drop blank on the, on the player's name. I can picture him. I had taken a slap shot and hit it dead on. And that's the only time that I've known that it's that the piece of glass has broken. But we obviously design it with that in mind. Talk about those early days of camera work when it was so cumbersome and difficult. I remember those camera guys coming into a press conference and replacing their beta tapes when they ran out during a press conference and and everything seemed really bulky and heavy. The camera technology, you know, we, we our business really took off in 1991. Uh, CCDs were just becoming more popular than Plumicon tubes. Plumicon tubes had to be engineered and set up a lot more than the CCDs, but that was just the beginning and beginning of allowing the camera to get smaller and the electronics and the boards to get smaller. So a beta cam, you know, a two piece beta cam at the time weighed about 30 pounds um, and a broadcast camera that isn't recording, but it's a broadcast camera that goes on your shoulder that probably weighed about 25 pounds. And there was not such a thing as a box camera, a camera that literally is the size of four or five boxes of cigarettes. And when we first did the NBA All-Star game, the camera that we used was a security camera um, that Dan Grange, who's the integral part of Fletcher Sports and the reason that Fletcher Sports really, really took off. It was his growth that uh, he drove, helped dr drive the business. I was the one who always came up with the ideas or a lot of times came up with the ideas. He's the one who implemented it. But 
Dan had to literally, he controlled pan and tilt. And we did that all-star game for the slam cam. And then I was pushing buttons, you know, pushing into zoom, pushing out to focus. And it was literally not designed for our industry. It was designed for the, the security business, but that business has a lot more, there's a lot more cameras sold in the security camera business than there is in the broadcast business. They just charge a lot less money and obviously a much bigger market. But I could see that's where the technology was going. And ultimately, we, we got today where a camera that's this size, the image quality is right there with a full-size handheld camera that you see a guy carrying on the sideline. For the news crews, you know, I hate to say it, but you'll see at press conference, you'll see news crews yeah. recording with a device like this. And the image quality is pretty dang good. And the audio is there. It's pretty convenient. There's something to be said for having what I'll call a real camera with a real lens. Mm -hmm. uh, but the camera technology, the, what you can do with an iPhone today is pretty amazing. So given that, do you see camera work as more complicated or less complicated because of the technology? Well, I think the technology is helping camera operators in a variety of ways. You know, one of the things that we're right now in the beginning of, in my opinion, is focus. Film, who I work for, as well as Canon, we both have long lenses, 107 by or 122 for Canon, um, that have autofocus built into them. And these lenses are $250,000. And when we talk to young kids, they're like, this is yeah, a $250,000 lens and it doesn't have autofocus. Are you kidding me? And you talk to the experienced camera operator and they'll very proudly say, I can do much better than what autofocus can do. But the technology is really coming about. And to me, again, one of the skills that I feel I have is, is that I can see the direction where things are going. That's an example of technology that that is about to really take off more and more. Mm, that's uh, something because autofocus in hockey is like, I mean, it, the game moves so fast. Football, at least you can kind of, there are moments where you can capture a really good shot without the movement interfering, but hockey can be so fast. <laughs> well, the, the key for what the, the autofocus has got to be able to do is, is as you're focused on a player and the referee slides in front of you, that it's not jumping to the referee. Yeah. And then as the referee, it's jumping to the player. You move off of the player, and then it jumps to the crowd. Fox has been using Megalodon, is what they call their camera, that after the player scores a touchdown, the camera operator runs on the field, and they're using an A7S Sony camera is what they started with. And it looked fantastic the first time they used it because it, the player is perfectly sharp and the crowd's yeah. way out of focus. Mm -hmm. And Twitter lit up. Like, it was like, oh my God, it looks like a video game. My son, who was 22 years old at the time, he's texting me, hey, turn on this Washington, Arizona game. He goes, take a look. This thing is, it's unbelievable. And Twitter is just blowing up about it. Uh, they had to learn how to use that and they had to learn how to use the autofocus part of it where a, the player would run out of the frame and it would jump to the crowd and it was really disarming and they've gotten much better at it. And the technology is just getting better and better every day. You had the foresight to see what Hollywood was doing in camera work and transferring those ideas to sport. How did you have this vision when nobody else did? When you're talking about seeing what others don't see. I'm thinking of that Wayne Gretzky quote where he goes where the puck is going to go. I love and that quote. So why why you? <laughs> no. I came up as a still photographer in college. I was on the yearbook and I was the photo editor of our yearbook my senior year. And I was on the Daily Illini newspaper for three of my four years of college. And it was great because first of all, I got to go to half the basketball games and almost every football game, went to the Rose Bowl, you know, went to an Elite Eight, you know, tournament following the team, went to every school in the Big Ten. But I always, when I started in the motion picture and, and the sports industry, 
I would always pay attention to the still photographers because that was what my background was. I, I got to know the different still photographers and I'd watch what they would do. So Andy Bernstein, I think from the NBA, who I think he's still shooting now, I'd watch him put a camera up behind the backboard. And at the time, the cam our cameras, the broadcast cameras were too small to fit back there. Mm -hmm. And so as I watched where Andy put the camera, I said, oh, we can put a camera. And because NBC Sports is paying millions and millions of dollars for rights, they're going to give NBC that camera position. Andy still kind of looks at me going, you're the guy who took away my camera position. He has to put his over on the other side of the backboard. <laughs> There's only a certain amount of real estate back there. So the still photographers look as I'm the guy who took away or Fletcher's the guy that the company that took away some of their camera positions. The other shot was a classic Sports Illustrated shot that they put in the rafters. They put the camera way up in the rafters, shooting right down the lane. And you could see the players as they're jumping for a rebound. They're looking right into the camera and it made oh, for wow. an incredible yeah. picture. So we as a company were like, okay, how do we do that? And first thought was, well, we can put a camera up there. And then we looked at the angles and we saw the shot clock and we put the camera on the, on the shot clock for a grade eight tournament here in Chicago with ESPN. We had no idea how popular the shot was going to become so much so as the, the operators that operated for us that night we put Fletcher stickers on our equipment. That's just what you do. You put Fletcher stickers, of you course. know, probably have a Fletcher sticker. I do have a Fletcher sticker on the back of my phone. We put them everywhere. Marketing my, everything. <laughs> right. My operators put one on top of the backboard, looking down as we're doing the shot, not realizing how often it was going to be in the shot. And literally during the first quarter of the game, I got a phone call because I wasn't down at the game that night. I got a phone call from ESPN saying, you get your guys to take that sticker down at halftime. It's in every shot. <laughs> We're furious about it. And the league, what the smart thing that the NBA did is, is they, they knew that this shot was going to be a shot, something that they wanted to add into the NBA. They immediately made that the URL of the team for a long time, you'd see bulls.com or lakers.com. They wanted a consistent look to that, right. that advertising position. They didn't want one to be McDonald's, the other one to be American Airlines. It was only just a few years ago that they lifted that. And now you see advertising there, but I just always watch the still photographers. They are pretty smart and they're dealing with taking one picture for the most part. We're yeah. just taking, you know, 24, 60 you know, images or, or a higher frame rate. So. Yeah. Although they take hundreds of pictures to get that one picture. <laughs> they do. They do. And, I've watched uh, them editing it, after and they're there long after everybody else has gone trying to find that shot. Well, <laughs> again, watching still photographers and understanding the technological trends during the NBA finals, I can remember seeing Ann Ryan, who was my friend from the University of Illinois. She was my boss at the student newspaper down there. And she was working for USA Today as the Chicago photo editor. And she was shooting, I want to say it was the second year of the Bulls championship. And she had a digital camera. And she goes, I don't have to go into the lab and process and print my film. I'm literally able to take a picture and we're able to send it to you know, the, the, the paper to be printed. And that was like, holy, holy cow, this is incredible. Yeah. And just watched how that technology grew. And even as Fletcher um, on the motion picture side, we had motion picture cameras and we also had, had video cameras to rent to the, to the motion picture industry. And we could see the growth of what was happening in still photography to take a, a single image digitally as opposed to taking a single image photochemically. They just were about two to three years ahead of us. And our offices, fortunately enough, were also right across the street from Calumet Photographic in downtown Chicago on Goose Island. So between seeing my photo friends at NBA finals and watching Kelly and Matt, that was a good way to see where the technology was going. Mm. And robotics and remote access, it's revolutionized camera work. But have we kind of reached the pinnacle of where it can go 
Is there also a danger with AI and everything, removing the camera guy altogether? Well, mind you, you don't have to be there for the shot if you've got a robotic camera, but you need somebody off, oh, don't you? When we first started with this, Laurie Frost, who was the inventor of the hothead, who he shot movies like Clockwork Orange and Full Metal Jacket, he was the, considered the best camera assistant in all of all of the UK. He was just tired of having his his ass on the line, is how he would say it, hanging over a cliff. He goes, why don't we create a remote control camera position? He always was really adamant about, don't use the word robotic. We're not trying to replace the camera operator. All we're trying to do is move the camera operator. And so even when we do our two cameras on, you know, on the goal judge position and the center ice speed shot for hockey, there are three operators. They're all sitting next to each other underneath the stands, right by the Zamboni entrance. Um, but they're in the building and they are operating. There's not one guy who operates and, okay, let me operate first. This is the, the right um, goal and this is the left goal. They have mo one operator for each camera. So we, we are not replacing cameras. And same, same is true with the above the rim shot. There is, it's very rare that there's one operator, always two, because you're picking up the shot coming out a fast break in basketball. They get the rebound and they come up court. That shot is used so much. Is technology ultimately going to eliminate some camera positions? Looking into the future, I would say, yes, there's some technology that's going to allow that to happen just with the incredible resolution and, and the ability to, to find that. Uh, Fletcher, you know, since we, we sold Fletcher you know, uh, seven years ago, Fletcher does U.S. Open tennis with a system that they call Trace. It was actually not, it wasn't something built when I was there, but in the early rounds of the U.S. Open, they want to have coverage of every match. So let's just say there's 32 matches happening at one time. They don't want to have to have 32 different crews covering each match. So what Fletcher has built is an AI system that's going to cover tennis you know, using the AI information and it gives a decent shot for the audience of that's measured in hundreds, not in thousands or tens of thousands. It saved ESPN a fortune and they love Fletcher for that. So that type of technology is only going to grow. Um, but that human element, that human part is still so important. The directors and the camera operators anticipating the director and the, the commentators, they're on the shot before they know that the commentator, he's going to start talking about the offensive line coach next, and they already have the shot in their viewfinder ready to go. And that's what a great camera operator does. Um, will, AI be, will AI be able to do that? I don't think so. Yeah. Like they can't, I don't think AI can write a, an article either. <laughs> it takes out the human element and, and it takes out the actual storytelling, the, the purpose behind the storytelling. Yes. Yes. No, I agree. I agree. <laughs> so each arena has a character in my perspective, because it's such a different experience being, I mean, Edmonton is complete different experience than it is yep. any other arena I've ever been in. Um, how does the camera bring this into view and take into consideration, like the atmosphere and, and that character of the arena? Well, every building has different camera positions. I mean, especially the older buildings, when you go back to old Maple Leaf Garden, old Chicago Stadium, Boston Garden, those buildings were built before radio, let alone television. And now as they're building the architects, HOK is one of the major architects for the sports industry. They're literally trying to figure out where all the camera positions are as they're going. Andy Rosenberg, who I mentioned earlier, earlier, he's the one who invented the low slash position for basketball that literally highlighted the, the, the NBA players. And that's what helped grow the MBA is it's about the the camera position so each building you know Toronto has a unique camera position for the game play-by-play -play, just the way where they put it 
our cameras going in, putting it on top of the backboard, that's pretty consistent. And on top of the gold judge, that's part of the consistency of it. Switching over to, to baseball, we put a camera, or Fletcher puts a camera on now on the right field foul pole at Wrigley Field. And when I first heard about that, I said, I don't think, I don't know how, how well that's going to work. And then I went out to a game and watched the operator standing behind him like, oh, this is fantastic. And the director who does marquee games, Mike Fox, is just a maestro at using that camera. You get a ball hit into the corner, you know, that you can't always see the, the, the player as he's fielding it. Now you're right on top of him. And then you literally are following the throw going into second base. And it's a phenomenal shot. So uh, I love Edmonton's one building I never got to. I've been to pretty much most of the other buildings in the NHL. For me, the challenge is just making sure I figure out, okay, where are the trucks parked? You know, how do I get in and out of the building? Security has changed a lot in the last 32 years that I've been doing, doing this, having credentials and getting in and out. That That's always one of my biggest struggles, just understanding how how easy it is. And then the the friendliness of the building to help the camera crews. Mm. Um, one, yeah. of, one of the stories I, I, I like to tell is, I first of all, didn't know enough about the business. We did the 1991 Stanley Cup. It was Pittsburgh, Minnesota. And uh, it was the first Stanley Cup we did. And we had just gotten our hothead back from a movie called Prelude to a Kiss. It starred Meg Ryan and Alec Baldwin. And uh, they had called me earlier in that week and said they were having some issues. And I showed up on set to fix the issue, which turned out to be the camera operator just didn't have the system plugged into a battery. <laughs> and I literally showed up and he yelled out, he's here to fix the hothead. He's here to fix the hothead. I was 25 years old showing up on a set with a hundred people, biggest set I've ever been on in my life. And they're all standing around waiting for me to get there to, to do the shot. Cause the camera's not working. There's a camera hanging over the bed, looking down as Alec Baldwin and Meg Ryan are in a, in a bedroom scene so I walk up and I recognize Meg Ryan and Alec Baldwin and I walk behind and the camera operators behind. He goes, oh, they didn't give me enough time because I can't figure out why it's not working. It won't do a thing. And I literally look around and I'm like, hey, let's plug this in. <laughs> and, and he goes, oh, because he and he starts starts moving the wheels and the head's working. And I said, OK, good. I'll walk out now. And he goes, no, you can't walk out right now because you need to stay bound here. You need to, you know, let's talk for a few minutes. And so we talked for about five, probably five, 10 minutes. And then he came out and he goes, he fixed the hot and he fixed the hot end. <laughs> and the cinematographer came out and he kind of yelled at me and said, oh, I should have used the power pod. And the producer came out, you know how much money you cost us? He goes, I'm going to keep this head through the weekend because you cost us so much money tonight. Because you didn't plug it in, right? Personally, <laughs> but I, I one of the smart things that I did do that night was is I did not say that it wasn't my fault, it wasn't our yeah. fault, your camera operator's fault, because that ingratiated the crew that we stood up for them, yeah. the crew, yeah. the relationship that rental houses have with the cinematographers and the camera crews is, is that have each other's backs, yeah. and so that night I had that camera operators back. He ultimately went on to become a cinematographer and was a big customer of our motion picture side. I did television shows with him and he always remembered that I did not make say, hey, he didn't have it plugged in. Yeah. But that's huge. They also, they also continued to, to destroy the inside of the hot head. So when we took the head to Pittsburgh to do game one of the Stanley Cup, our very first Stanley Cup, we got the head, they gave us an, you know, half an hour to put the camera attached to the bottom of the Pittsburgh Civic Arena scoreboard. And uh, they raise up the scoreboard, you know, and we do not have zoom and focus. Oh, boy. And that's a major problem because with hockey, one of the main things that they use the, the scoreboard camera position for is it's a reverse camera angle. So you always have your cameras on one side of the 180 degree rule. And so you're shooting the benches, but you need to have a reverse shot that's getting the penalty box. 
So whenever there's a storyline of somebody being in the penalty box, they only have them from the side, from the end zones, and that's not as good of a shot. So they would use the scoreboard shot to be able to get the reverse shot of the penalty box. And so if we couldn't go in and give them that shot, it was a big problem to them. And so Tim Schultz called me and I'm up in the crow's nest in Pittsburgh Civic Arena. And he says, Tom, you better get this to work. If you don't get this to work, we're never using you and you're never going to work in sports again. God. And, and uh, I literally found a guy, Timmy Cubet, to fix it. But again, going back to the question of dealing with the building, I didn't understand unions. And I didn't understand how well, to right. do it. That's another complication. <laughs> so I, I, they said to me, okay, you have 15 minutes to get the, the head out of, we're going to lower the scoreboard. They had a concert in there the next night. Frank Sinatra, I happen to remember, you know, Frank. And they go, we got to turn the building around and get ready for a Frank Sinatra concert the next night. And we're going to do it right after. So you have 15 minutes. I literally got the kid that was serving popcorn, you know, <laughs> in sweets to say, hey, will you help me out? And the Pittsburgh Civic Arena staff was not happy. They didn't ask one of their technicians to help me. And then they snapped our cables, lowered it down, and they complicated our life. But we obviously got it working because if we didn't, I believe that we would not have worked again. So it, we're very fortunate, but you got to understand how buildings work and the people and the rules and follow those rules. So Madison Square Garden, Pittsburgh Civic Arena, you know, Chicago Stadium, those are buildings you got to make sure you follow the rules. Yeah, and they do have a list of rules in every arena. Like I know I've seen them in the media lounge where you've got, you can only be here, you can only be here, you've got this much time. And there's a guy coordinating the cameras. Well, stills anyway, I imagine it's the same for... Yeah, no, it, it's for the other, and he's got to coordinate because you got to give everybody a chance at certain positions that, like behind the um, where the Zamboni comes out, you know, not you can't have 300 cameramen standing there, so they well, give well, some of the time slots there. With, with broadcast, it really just boils down to the revenue money that they've paid, and then in uh, hockey in yeah. particular. It depends on where you're at. So in hockey, back in that Pittsburgh, Minnesota North Star hockey game that I was talking about earlier, the 91 Stanley Cup, there were five broadcasters there that night. There was U.S. Sports Channel America. There was Canadian English, Canadian French. You mean five rights holders. <laughs> five rights holders. Yeah. So five broadcasters are in there that night covering the game, cutting their own show and wanting to highlight their players and to be honest having a five-way or even a three-way broadcast what that was beneficial to Fletcher and remote control cameras because when ESPN had to go to Canada they were the third choice they got the third camera position choice the English speaking got it first CBC got it first and then the French Canadian broadcaster got the second choice and then ESPN and uh, so they wanted to have their game camera and their tight ISOs. There's only so many positions you can put in the old, in those old buildings. Yeah. I love that story about the technology failing because that is one thing that does happen, you know, sometimes more than we like where you hit play and nothing happens. <laughs> it taught us a really valuable lesson in that, from that standpoint, from that point forward, we always went out with spares whenever possible. Um, we had gotten the head back from prelude to a kiss and we checked to see if it panned and tilt. We didn't check the cabling through the, through the head. Obviously we needed to do that. That was a mistake on our part, but you know, that really just set us up because Fletcher does five to 6,000 sporting events a year and we have wow. very little failures. And the equipment's got to work, especially in today's day and age of sports gambling. Our camera angles are vital to knowing, did that puck cross the goal? Did the football player cross the goal line? The robotic cameras we do in the NFL is we put robotic cameras right at the goal line with our high-speed cameras that we have. That's one of the critical angles to show, did he cross the line or not? Yeah. And uh, um, games live and die on those shots. 
Yes. So Memento is such a genius idea where the fans can have keepsakes of photos of themselves at sporting events. Where, how did this idea come about? Well, this is actually my son's idea and my son's cool. business, Austin. He was always around sports business. He just said, why aren't they doing something for the fans? And, you know, with kids, they're used to taking pictures and they're used to being able to zoom and recompose the shot afterwards. And he's like, okay, if we had a camera that had the technology, the, the, the resolution that we could shoot 5,000 people at one time and then index the seats and then we can deliver the ticket to each, the, the picture to each fan in the moment that they're celebrating. So, you know, last night we're, we were not installed down in Houston. As I'm watching the Michigan fans going nuts, and I'm sorry to timestamp your, this interview, uh, <laughs> but you know, any sporting event, you see the fans reacting, we're getting that reaction. So we installed into the Seattle Seahawks midway through the season, and we're capturing 68,000 fans and the Seattle Kraken saw it, and now we're installed into the Climate Pledge Arena, and we're also installed into the Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, mm -hmm. Both the Kraken and the Lightning are considered uh, more forward-thinking franchises as far as they need to be innovative to get to sell hockey in Florida, even when they don't have a good team. I mean, Tampa yeah. has had a great team for a long time, but... They know they have to build the foundation and the Seahawks in particular, they saw this as something that celebrates their 12th man yeah. as something that they really lean into. And this is something that has been a, a hard concept to explain to somebody is that every fan can see a picture of themselves during each of the big moments. So you stand up and cheer. We literally go click, 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 click take five to seven we get a gif sequence and then we can deliver a ticket you know that's the thing that oh, people wow, like that is so cool is, is being able to get a commemorative ticket with you in the moment celebrating uh and it can be sent to you to your home or you can get it from a kiosk but you can just get it on your phone you put in your seat and we chop up that wide shot and we're giving you a picture of yourself celebrating. So it's really fun because I worked with my dad and ironically, not ironically, but sadly, he passed away the day before I found out about this award. Ken Agart was having trouble getting a hold oh, of wow. me the day before, the day that my father passed. And then he, I saw he had called the day before and he called again and I, I picked up the phone and Ken told me and, you know, it was just hard to hear the news considering I had started this business with my dad together back in 1987. And my dad, before he passed, he was a big help in, in guiding us both um, financially as well as just his wisdom, his business wisdom to get Memento started. But it's fun working with my son because I was on the other side of it because, you know, my son's the one busting his ass working 12 hour days and figuring out how to how to write code and do all this and build these housings and uh i like being in the old man position much more. <laughs> well i see your son could uh sign up his next arena as rogers place in edmonton because if there are fans as good as seattle seahawks i would say yeah. yes here. <laughs> yeah i think hockey is the sport that we're gonna uh, have our, our initial success in, I mean, the Seahawks was smaller great. venue, right? <laughs> smaller venue. The other thing that's good about hockey and basketball arenas is that there's multiple sports that happen in there on a regular basis. So we also can, we also can cover concerts. So once the cameras are in, we can cover other events in the building. We have some lighting issues that we're working out, but you know, it's 16,000 people as opposed to 68,000 people. So it's a little bit easier for the install. And as I talked to my my friends at the NHL, and that was the league that I was always the closest to. And then I was thrilled that Gary Bettman gave as part of my introductory video, 
that Gary was was interviewed for it and talked about Fletcher's yeah. impact on the sport of hockey and the growth. And uh, as I said to him, it wouldn't have happened if we didn't have him in our corner fighting for us and his broadcasting departments. Mm -hmm. You know, all the people that work for him over the years. Each of the league have a broadcast department that look out for the look out for all the individual teams. So when you do have those five way broadcasts, you need a referee. You need that mom <laughs> literally to, you know, okay, they get upset because when you're borrowing, when you're taking a feed from another another broadcaster, you know, they'll need you to stay on that and not pan off of it too quickly. They can see the away feed that's taking part of that camera angle. And I've, I've seen arguments before, but the broadcasting departments in both the NBA and the NHL and Major League Baseball, all three of them are phenomenal. The NFL is a little bit different just because of, of the limitation of, of the number of broadcasts. The, the rights holder aspect seems like another podcast. It's very, very interesting and, and complicated. <laughs> One of the ways that we were able to grow our business so well was in 1991, we got invited to the NBA broadcaster meetings. Uh, Michael McCullough, who at the time was working in the broadcast department, now he is the president or the CMO for the Miami Heat. He's like one of the top people at the Miami Heat. But he invited us, you know, we had this new technology that NBC had just used during the NBA finals. They'd gotten huge ratings. And he invited us, he go, we got all the rights holders together for a meeting. We're going to be in New York City. We'd like you to explain this technology to all the rights holders. And we're like, oh, the NBA has these meetings. I'm guessing the NHL has those meetings. So we went to Chante Leclerc in Quebec. And literally the broadcaster meetings were all the rights holders mm -hmm. and the truck vendors, the people yeah. that supply the equipment and you know, they discuss what their issues are and how they can make the sport of hockey better on television. How can every team uh, get to interview Yamir Yager? At the time, he was the star player. You know, you, you got to understand sometimes sometimes you're not going to get Yamir Yager and Yamir Yager isn't always comfortable with his English and he sometimes just needs a break. How do you navigate that? And those broadcasting departments did a good job. And for us in particular, back to back to why I'm here, is they help fight to allow us to put cameras in places that you couldn't, you'd never had one before. Putting mm -hmm. in a camera in center ice for the all-star game in Montreal, I mean, you know, all-star game in Toronto, putting a camera in center ice where the puck is getting dropped and Carrie Frazier is literally cleaning the lens before the puck drops. <laughs> what was fun for us is we did that in Toronto when they had the all-star game the first time, the all-star game's going back there again. That's where I feel old when the all-star games are going. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> but uh, we did it. We did it in Toronto. And then after the game, unbeknownst to us, they took that camera and put it in the hockey hall of fame. And then the next year they said, we want to do that shot again. And we were looking around our shop and we're trying to figure out where did that camera go? And then finally <laughs> somebody told us, you know, it's in the hall of fame, right? So we literally went to Toronto they had the league go in, take it out of the hall of fame and <laughs> take it to the all-star game. And we used it one more time and the gimmick, that was a little bit more of a gimmick shot. Wow. And the last last story I like to tell, sorry. Uh, these, That's these all right. Are, Keep going. Go story. <laughs> we, another, I'll call it more of a gimmick shot, was during the skills competition, you have the targets that the players, you know, the plates, the, the players' accuracy shooting contest. Ray Bork would win it almost every year. What we did is we put a camera into the target. It was a circuit board camera. It was about the size of a credit card. But the puck is coming right at you. And it was a great shot. Oh. So I had to be the one out on the ice changing after every time they got destroyed. I needed to put a new fresh one up and plug in the cables and do everything. And at an all-star game, every player has to do something in the all-star game. And the more seniority that you have, you get to choose what you want to do. So Ray Bork, who had a lot of seniority, he always chose accuracy contests because he was really good at it. But the players are always really nervous at doing. And I remember talking to Brendan Shanahan, you know, before the first time we put it in the targets. 
and saying, hey, play up to the camera. There's going to be a camera on the targets. Maybe come down there and look at it. ESPN wants to have some fun with this. And he's like, oh, he goes, I'm just terrified. I don't want to go out and make a fool of myself. He goes, I just, I just want to make sure I hit a target. So he didn't want to have anything to do with it. Ronick actually played up a little bit to it. But when I went on the ice to change the targets, I realized that the players that had the most seniority were Wayne Gretzky and Mario Lemieux. So when I was in the net changing the targets, Lemieux and Gretzky, Gretzky was on my right wing, Lemieux was on my left wing. In my head, I'm thinking I'm centering a line with Lemieux and Gretzky. And, <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> and I'm on my skates, actually, because it was just easier to skate and make and do this. I didn't say anything to either one of them because I didn't want to ruin the moment because I knew if I said anything, it probably wouldn't, it wouldn't be anything. But uh, I can say I, I I was I was on the ice, Lemieux was on my right, Gretzky was on my right. <laughs> In the skills competition, they have a player that passes the puck <clears throat> yeah. player so that that's the cushiest job to have. <laughs> so they pass the puck to the person who's, who's putting their, their ego on the line, trying to hit the, the targets. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and you'll see the fastest skaters, generally the youngest skaters. That's not a desirable thing because people are afraid they're going to wipe out. So Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots of fun. I, mean, I mean, would imagine this honor means a lot to you now that your dad has gone and he's the one that really brought you into this business. Um, where does it go from here? Like, I do not see you ever retiring. So No, I like working. I work with Fujinon right now still, too, as, as my son is starting Memento going. And we just built a, a new lens that was... Again, not to date this podcast, but we used it last night on the national championship game and Jimmy Platt used it on the Rose Bowl. And it gives that little bit of a cinematic feel. It's shooting mm. Super 35 from a sideline cart camera position. And it's not quite as jarring as the Megalodon camera angle is. But when you see it, you look at that quarterback and that quarterback stands out and the quarterback's in focus and the and the right tackle or the left tackle in front of them, if he's over center, they're slightly out of focus. Or the running back who's a few feet away is out of focus. And the audience doesn't necessarily know that it's a different type of technology. It's a super 35 sensor as opposed to a two-thirds inch broadcast sensor. Um, but it looks fantastic. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy Platt really leans into it. That lens is also being used on Fox and NBC in a slightly different capacity, ironically using Fletcher super slow-mo cameras. So that's been a lot of fun creating this lens and it's also being used in concerts. So like um, pretty much every major concert that's shooting now, they're shooting Super 35 or stand-up comedians, they're shooting with a more of a cinematic look. Mm -hmm. And we just created a long lens. Again, I, I'm good at seeing where the direction's going. And I yeah. said to my factory, we should build this lens. And it costs a lot of money to build a lens. The R&D to build a lens is about a million bucks. And uh, they had to um, believe me that there was a market and we've sold just a ton of them. I enjoy that. And I don't see myself wanting to retire. I can say that. Yeah, the concert scene is, uh, well, Taylor Swift has changed it. So now you actually have to have cinematic cameras to be in a theater. <laughs> Yeah, no, that was that was a good show. There were a variety of of our lenses on that show. They had six of this new lens I was talking about on that show, and they also had thirty plus cameras. So it yeah. was an amazing cinematic feat. But uh, pretty much all the Netflix, sh you know, shows, all the Beyonce, all those recordings are now being shot like it's a movie, and they're using cinematic lenses the two worlds, the cinema world and the broadcast worlds are really coming together. And for me, I'm fortunate enough to have lived in both areas and had pretty good success in both sides. Getting this award for me is really um, uh, a, a tremendous honor. It's hard mm -hmm. with my father. Um, as I said, I mentioned Dan Grange earlier, This I would not have received this award if it wasn't for Dan really understanding and growing the business. 
he put in the long hours and I kind of got become, came more involved in the motion picture side of our business, but I'm, um, I'm really excited. And even and, and it, from a memento standpoint, it, it, as we're having conversations, it's okay. It's like, not that I just had worked in the sports business, but yeah. you know, work the sports business that I'm getting inducted into a pretty rarefied group. Some of the other technical people, Garrett Brown, who invented the Steadicam and the Skycam, which we talked a little bit about earlier, Skycam, uh, and then Leonard Chapman, which is the the dollies you see on the sidelines of carts of football games, right? The dollies and carts that go back and forth. Those are two people that I know personally and uh, greatly admire everything that Garrett Brown does. I'm extremely humbled to be in the in this group of people. Well, it's absolutely deserved and thank you for bringing such amazing shots into our everyday life so yeah thank you for this tom i really appreciate oh you're it. welcome thank you debbie <laughs> this is debbie ellickson thank you to my guest and to you the viewer for watching this episode of locker room for growth please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the youtube playlist the show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.